I really have always felt that my good fortune was knowing what I wanted to do, and that just unfolded um, in my life early on because uh, when I was 11, our family's home burned down, and I had a very worldly, forward-thinking mother who decided she'd hire an architect in Moorhead, Minnesota, um, to design a new home for this beautiful property that uh, we lived on out in the country. And so through that process of watching and learning what an architect was, and um, I was one of six kids, but I was really interested in that project, so my mom let me sit in on all the meetings, and I was just fascinated by the whole idea of manipulation of space and the three-dimensionality of it and the functionality and, and that type of thing. And so that exposed me to the notion of what architecture and interior architecture and thus interior design was. And I began um, studying and, and reading all that I could about it and, and uh, just knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, decided to come to the University of Minnesota because I liked the Twin Cities and I think it's a good idea, if you can, to try to choose a college or university in an area, a metropolitan area, where you might like to practice because it's where your network begins, which is such an important thing. And I was um, really fortunate at the time I was here to have two um, of the most outstanding interior design professionals in the world um, today as teachers at that time, just as you're fortunate to have Jeffrey Worth. I mean, that's pretty amazing exposure to a real mover and shaker and somebody who could not only answer a lot of questions but open a lot of doors for you. Um, I had uh, Gary Wheeler and Nyla Hildebrand and they were um, young entrepreneurs. They had started a partnership and uh, just became very successful in the commercial interior design world. They sold out to um, what is now Perkins and Will and um, one of them is in Los Angeles and the other is in London and um, they just each kind of took me under their wing and really um, helped me to fulfill my potential. They opened the doors to my first two jobs. I, I always worked two jobs while I was in school. One a money-making one because I put myself through school and one a design-oriented <coughs> one and they really hand-walked me into both my first two design jobs which were amazing opportunities um, and we've stayed in touch and they've always been there to answer questions and kind of point me in the right direction. So uh, I credit them hugely and it's one of the reasons that I feel so strongly about being in touch with students myself and involved in the College of Design here and, and mentoring and that type of thing because that's where so many op opportunities arise. So uh, I started out um, working at LRB Architects as was mentioned and I worked there for two years um, and it was a great experience but I really kind of hated it. Um, it was very dry, it was very, for me, it was very corporate, it was very, you know, I felt like I had to fill out a form and triplicate to go to, down the hall to the bathroom. And it just a little kind of too stifled and, and constrained, but it was really good experience and it was interdisciplinary, so I, under, I learned what all of the fellow professionals were and how a team works and I really learned how to document anything, how to process anything. And um, then I decided that I really wasn't happy and, you know, started rethinking my whole life's goal to end up in interior design because it, it wasn't for me. And so um, i just gotten married. My husband encouraged me to try something different. He said, you've always been all about design. This just isn't the right job. Try something different. And uh, had a social acquaintance approach me and say, you know, I understand that you're, um, you've been out in the field a couple of years in interior design, and I've got an interesting project I'm undertaking on Mount Curve in Minneapolis, renovating an historic mansion, and I'm kind of looking for an aggressive young up-and-comer to get involved in the project, and I'm looking for somebody who is hungry and is going to give me a, a pretty, um, pretty nuts-and-bolts proposal to work on this project. Why don't you give that some thought? So... I had no idea how to make a proposal to do a project. I've never, you know, been involved in that aspect of it. And I thought about it and I thought, well, you know, I'm really fortunate that my husband's buying the groceries and, you know, paying the rent and I don't have to worry about that right now for the first time in my life. And um, I really want this project and it'd be good exposure. And I hadn't thought about starting my own business. So I thought about it and thought about it and I went back to him and I said, okay, I'll work on the project for a year for $3,000. And, of course, he couldn't sign on the bottom line fast enough. And, you know, that was, 
That was uh, 1981, and now 25 years later, that would be two days of my time. So that was a pretty good deal. But it got me launched, and I worked with a very talented local architect who really um, appreciated where I filled in the gaps in his work. Um, it became obvious to me that there was an opportunity for an interior designer to sort of finish an architect's sentences, metaphorically speaking. Um, they are working from the outside in, we're working from the inside out, and there's a great and logical and intentional meeting place of those efforts, and if either part is missing, I think the project is lacking. So um, I actually worked on that project for about 18 months, and it led to trim just an explosion of referrals from this particular architect, the contractors, the client, et cetera, and before I knew it, I had my business, which I wasn't aiming to have anyway, but... Um, I loved what I was doing and um, worked away at that for a couple of years on just working on my own. And when I kind of grasped that I had sort of in, unwittingly started something, um, my husband, who is a business person, came from investment banking and um, was a stock trader and, and uh, had a good financial background, said, well, it seems you've got a business going. The first thing we better do is hire you a CPA. Because did I know from keeping books? I mean, really, it was frightening. So a CPA was the first employee and then an intern. And then before I knew it, um, it really needed to look at leasing bigger office space. And, you know, that's kind of how it unfolded. Very quickly, I was, I think, five people and then seven. And then throughout the years, it's pretty consistently been 12, 14, 11, you know, kind of depending on um, maternity leaves and absences and coming and going and that kind of thing. So... Um, that's kind of how it all unfolded. And I think really as I look back, the salient um, points that crystallized for me what the opportunities were, were this idea of practicing residential interior design, which was really kind of an up-and-coming profession at that time. It w I was doing a lot of missionary work explaining to people what an interior designer was, even at the most sophisticated dinner parties, cocktail parties, whatever. People really didn't know at that time. And the notion, you know, uh, I mean, to me, that doesn't seem like very long ago, or to Jeffrey or John maybe, but um, for you guys, 21 years is a long time ago. Um, the notion of a woman on a construction site was pretty novel then, and that's where I was spending a lot of my days, bossing big burly guys around and such. And um, so it was a lot of kind of teaching people and showing them what this profession was and what we had to offer. And then, um, the niche of residential new construction at a time in you know the early 80s when there was really beginning to be a boom in that and it was kind of the start of the big builder homes on steroids that have sort of gotten you know carried away now um, so these big projects were happening time and again and people were starting to think oh if I'm going to build a big home I should have an architect I should have an interior designer and starting to understand the team concept and then the idea that I understood I had a good business background and understood the concept of commercial project management and how to get a project done, not just coming up with a pretty idea and standing there and explaining it, but doing the technical drawings, the specifications, et cetera, to back it up was something that was lacking because many people at that time were just individuals working off their kitchen table. Many people still are. And then early on, I kind of decided it wasn't that fun playing alone in the sandbox and wanted other people to play with, and so started hiring people and just enjoyed that a lot more um, than working alone. And uh, as the years went on, it didn't take too long before I kind of realized, hey, I'm going to paint myself into a corner here if everything is identified with Laura Ramsey Engler Limited, which is how I had incorporated and um, thought that in order to make a move toward um, detaching the firm specifically from my own identity for growth opportunities, that I would drop the Laura and, you know, go by Ramsey Engler Limited, which sounded more like a partnership or a team or a commercial firm. We were also having more and more commercial design opportunities, even though that wasn't what I set out to do. Uh, it, they sort of came inadvertently um, through the relationships we'd created with residential clients. And so I felt that that sounded like a little bit more professional business-like name. And um, again, I, I'm such a believer in that self-fulfilling prophecy thing. I think it became a self-fulfilling prophecy that um, 
a few years down that road and into that mode of operating, and meanwhile, um, kind of growing and cultivating my team and um, getting them to the point where they weren't just, you know, interns and new, freshly minted college graduates, but people with some experience that I had really taught my way or the Ramsey Engler way of doing things, um, and starting to pull them forth into meetings more and making it very evident to clients, hey, you know, um, Bill worked on this part of the project. I'm going to pull him in and let him present it to you. So I've always been very overt with people, with our, our um, clients and with fellow professionals, that uh, the work that we produce is not by any means my work alone. It is all done by a team, and I love them to get all the credit. And it's a thrill for me. Um, I would say it's an equal th thrill for me to creating great design work and great relationships with clients as it is grooming these young professionals and seeing them come into their own. Um, that has turned out to be just a wonderful kind of side benefit for me. So that's maybe a little bit more about kind of the dynamic of the business and such. Um, what you're seeing in the slideshow is a I'm frankly not even sure what it is. It was just thrown together today. But it's a little bit of everything <laughs> once around the kitchen. Um, this is a, the yacht that we worked on. And, um, you know, without telling you the particulars of each photo, what you're probably observing is a real broad array of stylistic work. We're not known for any one style. That would be probably the next salient point of if I now were to retroactively write a brilliant business plan. Um, <laughs> you know, don't be known for just only one niche because if that comes and goes, you know, you're out of business. Um, so it all kind of ties into the team approach that um, we aren't just the flavor of the day. We're about problem solving, understanding the program, the needs, the desires of a client, and ferreting out what is right and appropriate for them in terms of style and design response in their work. And um, I'd be bored silly to do the same thing day in and day out. It'd be like Groundhog's Day. So I love the opportunity to kind of start anew every time, figure out what the problem is, and come up with a new aesthetic solution for it. And um, that's, as I say, what you're kind of seeing here. I mean, those two photos are a good example and good juxtaposition of that. Um, so, you know, we're, in terms of scope of our work, we're starting from a blank piece of paper many times. Sometimes we're the first person engaged, the first consultant engaged, and the client says, how do we find an architect? How do we find a contractor? And we set up the interviews. We help to put them in touch with these other resources and create the team. And then um, look at that blank piece of paper and start thinking about what sizes and shapes and functions the rooms should have, and we are typically the entity that's designing the cabinetry, lighting, fireplaces, millwork, all of the interior architectural finishes, um, all of the furnishings, window treatments, the tabletop, the bed linens, the bath linens, the bath accessories, the china, the... Um, we work on a lar lot of large projects and large estates, which I think my... Um, team kind of enjoyed hearing about. So some of the things they wanted me to share were um, some of the weird things we do, like um, <laughs> some of the lifestyle consulting things. I was telling them, you know, it's not atypical for me to, because we just get so involved in these relationships with people and we're kind of the expert on all fronts. You know, I, the phone calls I get in any given day could range from, um, okay, you know, it's May and I'm in good shape and my legs are tan and I'm going to a formal dinner party. Can I go without pantyhose or I de do I need to wear them? Um, so that could be one client calling for advice on that. And another client could be calling saying, do you remember if Susie, the daughter, left her pearl headband at the South Dakota house or the California house? Do you remember where you saw it last? Expecting me to know that level of detail, which sadly I probably do. Um, and, okay, and do you know where the jet is right now? Because if it's in South Dakota, maybe you could pick that up and it could bring it to California because she needs it for a party. And could you call the pilot? And so it's just kind of, you know, some interesting paths that things have, have taken um, that I wouldn't have necessarily anticipated. Um, all wonderful and really based on treasured relationships with clients, many of whom have become my dearest friends. Um, and 
one of the reasons for that, aside from the intense time spent together and the personal things that have to be shared to create a very personal space such as a home, um, is the degree of discretion and confidentiality they know they can count on us for. Um, we don't use clients' names, and um, every project we work on, we self-impose putting a code name on it, whether we've been asked to or not, because it isn't anybody else's business but their own. It's their story to tell, not ours. Um, we're welcome to tell them generically, and if I walked you through my studio or showed you my portfolio, I'd say this was a situation where um, we were working on a California beach house, and the program for the project was to remodel the kitchen and use um, sand-friendly flooring and accommodate <coughs> a family with X number of kids and, um, you know, that type of thing. But um, the identities would be um, concealed and, um, and kept private and, and that type of thing. So that, I think, has been another sort of factor in our um, growth is that people know we're trustworthy and I think it's that good Midwestern thing and it plays well in other parts of the country. It's a big part of what has helped us to expand elsewhere. The fact that um, I can go work on a California beach house, um, beach house meaning it's located on the beach, and um, not take time to walk on the beach or go surfing or whatever, which my California counterparts would be knocking off at 2 o'clock, you know, in the afternoon to do. And I'm the one that's, you know, working away until 10 o'clock at night, not even noticing the surf out there, which is, again, sort of tragic. But um, <clears throat> Or <laughs> working on that, um, you know, ski retreat in Colorado or something in the Florida Keys or, you know, the yacht where I'm, you know, testing out the place settings in the crystal. And all of a sudden I realized, unbeknownst to me, that the yacht has taken off and we're on sea trials. And the <laughs> mission of the day is to... <laughs> is to, um, you know, crank the engines to their um, highest level and c uh, execute the sharpest turns possible to see how the yacht performs while I have $200 a stem, you know, crystal that I'm lining up and training the staff and how to set the table. It's like, okay, this is a good sea trial. So anyway, um, those are some of the different kinds of experiences and, and opportunities that have come out of uh, the interior design work because it's a lifestyle oriented business which is another opportunity or factor that I hadn't been prescient enough to kind of recognize early on but has you know kind of quickly unfolded and um, it's led down some really gratifying paths. I don't know if Ashley? you want to pause that picture but I think that one's a good example of oh. kind of what the, no, I think detail, but not really yeah. detail, but what your inventory is and kind of how it's currently Set up. <laughs> well, now, it looks a little better than that, Ashley. <laughs> um, yeah, you can see our, our tags, Ramsey Engler Collections. We kind of have this whole nice set of identities um, set up and working into our logo and, and everything. But these are examples, as I, Ashley says, of things that I inventory. And I can continue to do that in my lower level, as James says, or my second floor. Um, and continue to operate that end of the business. Um, some of those are things that I'll actually go out and buy for clients too. I don't inventory every single towel, um, which the striped things are, or every possible lamp or that type of thing. But that's the extent to which we finish our projects. Um, and you know, it's you've got soap dispensers and lamps and throws and blankets and bedding. And a lot of times we're designing those kinds of elements custom. Um, have you ever had anybody ask you to like put a wardrobe inside of the house farm, like when they move in, like have just all their clothes, like what they're supposed to wear with like color coded tags on them or anything? Is that common? Yeah, uh, it's. I can't say it's common, but I have been asked to do that. Um, I take clients shopping for clothing. Um, I've helped them to design pieces of jewelry. I happen to have a minor in jewelry design, so that comes in handy. But um, I have gone to New York grocery shopping for a client to stock a pantry with exotic things they couldn't find where they lived. Um, yeah, a really personal level of service. I clean closets with them and I go through and say, I, you know, I can't believe you own this and you should never wear it again. Um, and I have one client whose closet I clean and she happens to be my size, so I take the hand-me-downs, <laughs> which is, is kind bad. of a nice, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hate that. That is terrible. Never should be seen in public in that. <laughs> <Okay>. <sighs> Different size shoes, though. That's sad. 
<laughs> but yeah, all those kinds of things, Greg. It's you know, again, um, I think that not only do they understand that my understanding of them um, crosses really a lot, covers a lot of territory and crosses a lot of boundaries, but their um, confidence in my discretion, my honesty, my taste, etc., um, is well placed, regardless of whether we're talking about how they should throw a party or um, how they should design um, a printed piece that they're wanting to use for something and uh, how they're presenting themselves in that format, how they're um, dressing, how they're uh, dining. I've had I've worked with private chefs on um, setting up more healthful lifestyles and uh, you know meals, um, that type of thing for families. Um, and I do uh, staff training. Um, so I this is that's my Joan. She's my senior project manager, and I adore her. She's been with me ten years, so she's one of my great team members. Um, sorry, it just caught my eye. Uh, where was I going? <laughs> Staff training. Um, for instance, I mentioned on the yacht, um, we were actually involved in um, establishing what the crew of 12 should be for this 160-foot yacht that we worked for three years designing, um, determining what kinds of personnel were needed to maintain the lifestyle for the clients on board, and then we uh, equipped the galley and the laundry facilities with the appropriate equipment to maintain the linens and to cook the things they like to cook. We worked with certainly restaurant consultants and other people on that. But um, then we trained the, uh, the crew in that case on the yacht as to how to make up all the beds and clean the baths and we designed their uniforms and different, several different scenarios of uniforms, including the um, you know Hawaiian luau getup and the formal service getup, and you know that kind of thing. And we bought the cocktail picks and the cocktail napkins, and you know all of those things. And then, in the case of the yacht, um, every single thing that is on board in an ocean-going vessel, an international ocean-going vessel, in that case, has to be secured. And so we literally had to draw on CAD um, the stowage for every box of cocktail picks, um, every stemmed crystal goblet, um, every towel, and its exact dimensions when folded because there wasn't a place for it. It couldn't go on board. So that's an extreme, I guess, of the level of detail we go to. But in a residence, we would be working with housekeepers, property managers, major domos, um, personal managers, financial people, um, you know, that type of thing on larger estates. And uh, some of those we go around, to, I go around to um, a number of times a year and just go through the entire house, w house with a fine tooth comb um, and change around things I want to change around, you know, identify what needs to be replaced or freshened up. If I don't like the way the housekeeping is happening, I meet with the housekeepers and go through that or suggest changes in staffing or that type of thing. So that's not every project, but that's a number of them. Um, it sounds like you're very involved to the minute detail of your projects. And you also talked about being stretched thin. Is there any way, have you thought about this, do you do this with some of your project managers that they take over some of those details, or is that a strength that you feel like you bring to the table? Well, that's a really good question, and um, I have a couple of people who've been with me for 10 years, and uh, Joan, who I pointed out, is really um, is someone that I consider to have a lot of the same abilities that I have and is, I think, um, as strong at creating relationships and intuiting what's needed and that type of thing. Um, that in her particular case, and this could be a whole other part of the discussion, one of the things I've chosen to do in my business is to create a lot of flexibility for people so that they can have the balance in their lives that, frankly, I wish I had had. I took like three days off both times I had my children and um, have worked to a crazy extent, and I have loved it, but I wouldn't wish that for someone else. And if I were now starting over again, um, I'd understand a little bit better that sometimes you can say no and sometimes you can make people wait. And so I wish that for my young people 
that are starting their families, and she and two other of my people have one-year-old children. And I encourage them anytime their child's sick or they have doctor appointments or school things or whatever, that that's where they need to be. And so Joan works <coughs> about a three-day week. And that's, she's always available. She's very committed. I could call her anytime, 24 hours a day, talk something through. She'd drop everything and attend to it if it needed to happen. Um, but her time is a limitation from that standpoint. And um, that's something that's important to me to, to respect. So that's one of the challenges with a younger team, um, and most of them are. I mean, I'm, you know, the, other than my CPA, and none of us know how old she is. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing I'm the oldest at 49. Um, so, no, I think she's older. Anyway, um, so, you know, they're all starting families and that type of thing. John? So you talked about a couple of business downturns you had to deal with, how do you manage that? Sure. Um, the... The first uh, really tough time was during the Gulf War. I know James remembers that. <laughs> um, and what happened was that we had a location at 50th and France at that time, and I was probably seven people. And we had gone into a mode to expand our retail because we were now at this retail visible location at 50th and France. So that's when I first started with accessori the um, inventory uh, of accessories and that type of thing. And we had extended ourselves and done that on credit. Typically, not a big um, fan of credit, which I know is sort of stupid in some regards, but. Thank you. Um, being in the interior the design business for over 20 years, I'm um, just kind of curious on how you keep up with the trends and, um, and the style from the 80s is definitely different from the style now, and how do you keep up with those? Uh, I am a voracious reader. Um, and I travel extensively. I travel almost every week um, for work in different parts of the country. That keeps me very well versed and I think makes me um, a real value to my clients in terms of my exposure to trends, um, both in, as far as aesthetics are concerned, as well as um, construction technology from other markets or materials um, availability from other markets. Uh, and that type of thing. So that's, for me, that's really, um, I think, a bonus and a real benefit. But um, reading, going to lectures, taking classes, I'm just, I, I have to be learning something all the time. When I go get in my car in a few minutes, I'm going to have my um, French 2 CDs playing so that I can keep that going while I'm driving and talking on my cell phone and, you know, drinking my shake for dinner or whatever it's going to be. So it's a lot of multitasking um, that keeps the learning flowing. James. Given the complexity and the uniqueness of that yacht project, are you uh, really looking forward to doing another one if you had a chance? Or? I would love to. It used our skill set um, to the greatest extent any project has. The, um, I don't know if anybody's ever read Dr. Howard Gardner's um, The uh, oh, what is it? The Seven Separate Intelligences, I think it's called. Um, fascinating book and relatively new theory of intelligence in learning and such that there is not just, you know, we're getting away from the one standard IQ test. And so he identifies these seven, seven separate areas, um, linguistic, kinesthetic, um, et cetera. The one that stands out in my mind is spatial because that's maybe the only one I've got. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think that the yacht project was all about that. There was not a right angle in the project. Everything that we were drawing had such dimensionality to it and add to that the challenge of needing to maximize the, the function of it, the seaworthiness of it. Um, it was a problem to be solved and I think when it comes down to it, that's probably one of the biggest things that motivates me. Carrie. Um, I guess I would be curious as to like what the ideal number of projects you're willing to take on at one time is and how long a typical project would take? Well, the ideal would be one at a time for about like three or four years. Um, that probably wouldn't be too much of a business plan, but um, that's what I would love. Um, the nice thing is that because we have uh, projects at different stages and different breadths, uh, one project might be redoing a room for a client that we've worked for many, many, many times. And another might be, you know, that blank piece of paper, whole estate. Um, and d because of the pace of the other team members, the pace of the construction, the pace of the client, et cetera, 
Um, I often have this visual of myself standing at a really huge gas stove, you know, like in a restaurant with all the burners and kind of turning the gas up and turning the gas down as I flux, you know, the workflow and kind of delegate it around my, my staff. Um, and that, that works very well. So we, I'd say we've at any given time got, I mean, if you looked on the, on the um, billing worksheets every month, we might send out as many as 30 bills for active projects, but one of those might be one consultation with a client. Um, another might be, or a couple of others might be working many hours every week intensively. Um, you know, some might sit dormant for six months. So, so there's a big, a wide variation in it. But, you know, my dream world would be one project at a time. Linda. Um, have you done any projects outside of the United States yet, or do you see it moving in that direction, or you could possibly start? I haven't. Um, I would certainly love to do that. I think it would be most likely with an expat client, you know, an American that's relocated elsewhere. It's really, that's really kind of how my national n network has happened. Um, connections all somehow tying back to the Midwest, either by referral basis or other extensions. So um, that, again, would be a great problem to be solved. I would enjoy, you know, dealing with the cultural um, differences and such. We actually were selected to make a proposal on um, a, an embassy with a renowned local architectural firm, and they didn't end up getting it, so we didn't. Um, but it was an embassy in um, Saudi Arabia. That would have been fascinating. So hope to have some of those opportunities. Andrea. Um, what role does marketing play in What role does marketing play? We've done a lot of marketing throughout the years, um, much more than many interior design firms have. Many print ads, um, full-page print ads, doing two or three local publications at a time each month, uh, uh, Twin Cities Business and Minneapolis Magazine, Minnesota Monthly. And I think that that's been important. We've presented a very strong visual image that people connect us with, I think, and sort of an iconic image that's built upon our square logo and squares of visual information. The interesting thing about that is um, I'm going to say that other than one random ad that I've run in the past year or 18 months. I really haven't been doing that. I run into people all the time that tell me, I see your ads every month. Or they'll say, gee, I see articles about you every month. Well, I mean, there are often articles about us every month, but it, it really sticks in their mind. Um, you know, you get a much longer play, I think, out of that print ad than you'd think. It doesn't just live for one, one month only. We've done a little bit of radio advertising, um, some different printed things. I think our, I, whereas I desperately need to revamp my whole website, I think it's pretty good um, as it is. And we get a lot of hits off of that. And word of mouth is huge. Yes? Um, do, you, do you ever like totally redesign like old houses, or is yes. it mainly just new developments? We definitely do. I'm actually um, working on a project in Boulder, Colorado right now, which is one of the oldest houses in that area. It's a great old Victorian, and um, it would be a very interesting challenge. It's on the National Historic Register, so we're very limited in terms of what we can do on the exterior. Um, but it's a young, hip bachelor, and he wants a pretty, you know, happy and interior. Um, and I think my charge is to do that with sensitivity so that it doesn't you know, really, frankly, bastardize what the house is about, but is done, you know, in an appropriate in an appropriate way, um, and yet suits his lifestyle, which is different than a turn of the century lifestyle was. So, yeah, we do lots of remodeling of, you know, boring '60s Ramblers, you know, historic Victorians, you know, whatever you can think of. Yeah. You're such a pleasant woman and such a wonderful disposition. What do you do when you're not working? Oh, you, thank you. I mean, I know you enjoy what you do, but thank you. I bake a lot of cookies. <laughs> big, big cookie baker. Um, I really am like perfecting all my different cookie recipes and eating them all. Um, I have two great kids um, that I try to spend as much time with as I can. They're both away. Um, I work out. That kind of keeps me healthy. Um, I take a lot of vitamins, which is sort of my second full-time job. God, that takes a lot of time. Vitamin management. Um, <laughs> I read, you know, like I say, just a tremendous amount. But I, you know, I think like everybody, I just um, try to really um, do everything that I can to kind of grab for all the gusto, you know, that's here. 
Um, I also, and this really surprises a lot of people, I could be very happy locked alone in my house for like a week, not talking to anybody, not, you know, um, I love time alone, and um, that's very restorative for me. So those are some of the, I love to ski, rollerblade, big rollerblader. Um, Bethany? Um, I'm not really familiar with your industry that much. Where do you feel like your biggest competitor in this area or country? Uh, we are um, one of the sort of biggest firms in the Midwest. Locally, when people interview interior designers, they typically interview us, um, Billy Beeson, and um, I think it's, I mean, that's probably kind of where it's at locally. At different points in time, I would have maybe added a, you know, sort of a third. I like to sort of pay for things and not have a lot of leases and ongoing obligations and that sort of thing, so you can turn on a dime if you need to. And um, we had extended ourselves uh, on credit with all these manufacturers at market and had inventoried rugs and all kinds of things that were quite costly, probably $100,000 worth. And the Gulf War hit, and everybody we were working with just pulled in their horns. Um, our clients said, oh, you know, it doesn't really seem right to be proceeding with that, you know, $3 million house right now. Or, oh, you know, I can wait. Typical kind of Minnesota ad attitude. Oh, you know, no, no, not at all. I don't need it. You know, it's enough kind of thing um, because we're conservative here and we wear the fur on the inside of our coats. And um, so it seemed the right thing to do to pull back. And that's really what they did. And it really hurt. Our design business, you know, plummeted. And so our receivables, which typically our um, billings for our consulting work cover all of our overhead. Um, they cover our salaries and, you know, that type of thing. And then sales on furnishings and such are, you know, the icing on the cake beyond that that enable us to do growth things and, and um, take everybody out for manicures and pedicures and that kind of thing, which is important. Um, but anyway, that's what happened. And we ended up calling um, Steve and my husband, uh, who was handling the business more actively at that time, called every vendor personally, very proactively, and said, here's the deal. You know, we're in Minnesota. We have this long-time established business. We have every reason to believe we'll be here for, you know, the next 10 years. I suppose we'd been there 10 years at that point. But we can't pay this bill. We've got the merchandise. It's sitting right here. We can box it up and send it back to you. You can take a leap of faith and let us sit with us, sit with it, knowing, that, you know, we'll keep in touch with you and let you know whether we feel there are any prospects for selling it. Um, it's not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere, but that's the deal. We can't pay the bill. And it was really interesting, the response that we got from the vendors. I think um, never avoiding their phone call, taking their phone call every time, saying, yes, we have the bill in front of us. We know we haven't paid. We know we owe it to you versus ducking the call um, and giving them that option and giving them the truth and giving you know them um, control of the situation. And some of them said, well, why don't you send the merchandise back? Um, some of them paid to have the merchandise sent back. Um, you know, others said, sit with it. Let's touch base in three months. Let's, let's touch base, you know, in six months. And that's how we got through that. Um, and meanwhile, then the, you know, design consulting business built back up again, and the revenue started flowing from that. And um, the retail kicked back in. And when it did, one of the really interesting observations that I made is, and again, this goes back, you know, I don't know, when, when did you say the Gulf War was? Okay. So, 16 years ago, and um, if somebody would walk in the door to my retail store to buy something, and I had $30 things and $100 things and $1,000 things, it'd be the $1,000 thing that would walk out the door because it's what they couldn't find anywhere else, and because it was handpicked by a designer, and because I know the local clients, and so it didn't take too many of those sales to kind of get us whole again. Um, Yes, Patrick. I was wondering, you mentioned that you uh, used CAD um, to uh, plan space on your yacht. Is uh, computer design a big part of your design process, and how do you incorporate that into your design? That's a great question. Um, in fact, one of my proudest moments on that project was we, being a you know landlocked Midwestern firm chosen to do this pretty amazing yacht project, we're working with um, nautical architects based both in Holland and in Manhattan, old line, very venerable Manhattan yacht design firm. 
Sparkman and Stevens, and they so overtly um, were disdainful of our selection as the design firm and couldn't quite fathom, um, despite the fact that we had worked on a number of yacht refits, how we were in any way capable for this project. And so when we went to meet with them the first time um, at their offices in Manhattan, and they said, well, now you know, we can send you these computer-aided drafting and design plans electronically. You know, do you know what that is? I said, yes. <laughs> we operate on AutoCAD. Really? What version are you on? And I forget what year it was, but whatever year it is, we're on that year plus. We are extremely cutting edge. So we were like about a half a decade ahead of them on their on their version of AutoCAD, and that sort of set the playing field a little bit more level. They had to, um, we had to actually dumb our drawings down to send them back and forth to them. So we generated probably about 1,500 drawings on that project. Um, we worked on it for over three years. It should have been a three-year project, but the shipyard was in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, and if you don't hit a launch date um, to get out of there through the Great Lakes, um, you miss it and you're ice locked in for the, the rest of the season. So that bought us some extra time because the shipyard was a little behind. So it was a really a four-year project. And the CAD is a huge part of what we do every day. Every person in our studio, except me, um, works on it. And it's really difficult to do things old school anymore. You still have to know how to manually draft. I think that's critical. I'm very fluent, and I insist that everybody else be. And if, if we were discussing something right now, I'd need to be able to sketch that detail and say, this is what we're talking about. Um, and you can't do that on CAD in the same way. There's a place for both of them. Just curious about what program you We're on AutoCAD okay. 2006. Um, you, you focused a lot on uh, personal service and personal wellness. Is that typical of the interior design industry, or were you able to kind of transcend the industries and really differentiate yourself from your competitors by focusing on that? I don't think it is completely typical of the interior design profession or industry. Um, I think it has to do with the fact that I recognized pretty early that one of the um, key pieces to a successful project for us was a successful relationship versus a transaction. Ours is not a transaction business as we choose to practice it. For many other designers, um, I think that it is a transaction. We choose to be compensated for our time on an hourly fee basis as consultants. If we sell furnishings to a client, which we typically do, we take the net cost that we buy it at as um, designers at wholesale, and we mark that up 40% plus freight, which, is, which amounts to splitting the discount with the client. Um, so it's a good deal for both of us. It, it gives us a bit of a profit center, and it covers our overhead to process orders and all of that, and they buy it for less than they would if they went out and, and did it at retail. But primarily, we focus on being paid for our time and expertise. I should say for our expertise, which we've chosen to translate into the module of hourly time, you have to figure out some module that your expertise comes in, gets compensated for. I think a lot of other designers are very oriented in their business model and their philosophy toward selling. And I'll give you an example. I got a project, um, it was a huge 12,000 square foot home that had been underway for about uh, 18 months. It was three months away from completion. Three months away from completion. So ground had been broken. Um, it, it was probably 18 months prior to that. Been under construction, all these tradespeople in there, et cetera. Three months before the people were supposed to move in, and they'd had two different designers they'd hired, there was not a cabinet designed. There was not a tile selected. There were no appliance specifications, no plumbing fixture specifications, et cetera. Now, it takes us six months to get furnishings. So, you know, the work that hadn't been done should have been happening months and months and months before that. What that designer had been interested in and had done was to sell those people about 20 very costly rugs for floors that weren't specified yet, furnishings, art, things that there were no finished rooms to put them in. So they realized they had a problem, and they called us, and they hired us, and we got the entire house designed, furnished, and done in three months. 
because we were focused on using our expertise and not on selling them things. So I hope that answers your question. Person into that. You know, how do you talk about sort of who your competitors are in that their our firm is unique? Um, Billy Beeson's is a group of independent professionals and they sort of compete with one another. That's the antithesis of what we do. Um, they are, they tend to be known for, oh, Gunkelman Flesher, sorry, they're important. Um, and I greatly admire him, um, them. Uh, but they typically do strictly contemporary and, you know, so they each have a little stronger stylistic niche than we do. Um, and there are some great independent designers, very talented, that I really admire. Um, you know, I th always tell people when we're interviewing that it's, uh, um, I have to think of the words of my daughter's college counselor who said, um, college is not a prize to be won, it's a match to be made. And I think that that's a really good adage for a lot of things. Um, that's how I look at the interior design relationship and I think any consulting relationship, that it's got to work well both ways. And there are times when I say to someone, um, gosh, you know, I so appreciate you considering us and I think that you've got an exciting project. I frankly don't think we're necessarily the best fit for you, but I think you should call this person or this person. And I think that might click better and I'll get a phone call later from both of them saying, how did you know that? Thank you so much. That was a great fit. And so you just try to kind of make a win-win. Yes, Chris. So you lost pants on your first job at $3,000 and it took you a year and a half to do it. So how do you go from losing your pants to where you're at now as far as just determining what it is that you can charge and what the market would bear? Uh, you know, that I'll tell you frankly, I oftentimes kind of get a reality check by a client saying to me, you're too inexpensive. You know, I, do you realize what I pay my copier repair person? Or, mm -hmm. And I kind of come up for air and I say, oh, okay, yeah, I haven't raised my fees for four years. Or, you know, and I do work in other parts of the country. I mean, our fee basis is definitely lower than, you know, I'd at least be double on either coast. Um, and that's probably why a lot of clients fly me around. I mean, I'm a really good value. Um, in in that regard. Uh, so you have to kind of, I meet with my, I'm very collaborative with, with my other fellow professionals, um, get together and go out for dinner and drinks with them and talk about our businesses and um, we talk about what we're charging and uh, how we're staffed and those kinds of things and try to learn from each other. You know, I believe there's enough out there for everybody. So I think being collaborative is really smart. That's why Burger King open, opens up next to McDonald's, you know. Jenna. Um, I'm just curious, I mean, you're so knowledgeable in, in your work and, and beyond that, obviously, by what people call you about. Um, however, I'm just curious, like, where did you start? How, when did you start looking into these kinds of things and learning more and desiring to learn more? And how old were you, like, how compared to where we're at right now, where were you? Well, um, you know, I'm pretty possessed. Um, <laughs> like I say, I... <laughs> I just, I really do have a voracious desire to learn about whatever it is I'm doing. So if somebody tells me, you know, we're going to be working on a project and um, it's an, an historic Victorian that has an Edwardian twist to it, the first thing I do is either have an assistant start doing research on the Internet. Um, we do a lot of research in our firm. I go to bookstores. I might take a key trip somewhere where I know I can be immersed in that type of genre. I will oftentimes, if it's a situation where um, something about uh, cu cuisine or culture or music or, you know, of an era or of a locale would help me to sort of get immersed in what I'm doing, I might spend, I happen to love languages, so I might spend a little bit of time with the language. Um, uh, one of my other hobbies has always been reading the dictionary. I mean, I grew up out in the country. There wasn't a lot to do. Um, so uh, it's all those things, and it's really been kind of forever. I, I don't sit very well, and I don't watch TV particularly. Um, so that leaves a lot of time on your hands. If you don't sit, you don't watch TV. You can get a lot done. James? You have mentioned about customers coming back time and time again. Tell just a ballpark number of the customer that sticks out in your mind the most that's come back the many Times, what, six 10, homes. Ten times. Six, six homes times. over fifteen years. Six homes. Oh. Six homes. Oh. Thanks, Bruce. 
<laughs> yeah, they How like real estate. Totally. I'm sorry? How much do you think you've made off that money? I have no, I I have no idea, and I just I, I don't look at that. I just don't, and I I don't mean to sound stupid or naive, but that's not what drives me. I mean, I've made a nice a nice amount of money. I do. I will tell you this: they helped me buy a nice house. Yeah. Uh, how are we doing on time? Should we keep going? Okay. Um, I had a question. I, I understand where you end, like with like self dispensers or even like, um, like lifestyle consultation to your client. Where do you start? Like, say, you know, you have somebody that comes in that they want to build a new house and they have this giant lawn. Do you work with the landscaper? Do you work? I mean, are you like doing on site management of what um, the construction should be doing and should be doing? It? Like. How, yes. how far involved you get when you're starting a like, like project? When we're working with a really capable general contractor, which is always our wish, uh, they are coordinating and holding typically the subcontracts for a lot of the other entities. But yes, we are always collaborating with landscape architects, um, might be acoustical consultants or, um, oh, you know, certainly the AV consultants and, and those types of things. And with our piece of it, there comes a point on a job site where I'm out there supervising a finisher that's executing a finish I've designed. Um, so it is hands-on. And the question of where it starts is a great one. It really starts with getting to know a client, more importantly by listening to what they're not saying or understanding what they're not able to articulate by reading subliminal clues that I'm getting from them, by understanding their values is a really big piece to me because everybody has a different motivation for undertaking a project. And if I don't understand what that is, I won't be successful on their behalf. Um, so that getting to know the person and establishing and helping them to list out their desires and requirements room by room, area by area, um, understanding the makeup of a family unit or, you know, a, a business structure that's going to operate. It's, it's things that are just really verbal communication things um, that begin the process of getting to know a client and starting to help them ferret out what they're after because very few people, if any, come to me with a tangible list and program and, okay, here's the project, go do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.